right, as usual, uh, quick reminder, you got your programming test number two tomorrow. And as I mentioned before, it's going to be a simplified version of your lab two. So as long as you know what you did for lab two, you run the uh, grading tests, and also if you want to go over the solution walkthrough, I think that's the way to get prepared, right? It's gonna be a simplified version of lab two. No, uh, nothing about equality and nothing about aggregation or composition. That's what you should know. No, this time, I think uh, since it's gonna be a simplified version of a lab two, so you just gotta make sure you know what you're supposed to do for lab two. I think that'll be enough. All right, and then for your lab number three, that one is about equality and copy constructor. That will be due this Wednesday, right? Just make sure you submit that in time. It's gonna also help you for the subsequent, the final lab test later, programming test. Your written test number two uh, has been released on Friday. If you got any concern or you wanna go over answer together with me, you're more than welcome to reach out to me and then we'll talk about it in office hour or appointment. Programming test one, my offer stands. If you wanna go over your solution, you're always welcome. All right. Okay, so let's now talk about inheritance. So you can think about last Wednesday, we only just uh, introduced you to this uh, little problem about student management system. That's basically what we had you read about the description, right? I'm gonna assume everybody kind of uh, already got familiar with the problem. And we did a little exercise about identifying the important nouns and verbs to see how we are supposed to implement. So for, for today's roadmap, we're gonna cover the first aspect of inheritance, which is kind of superficial, but it's also important. That's what typically people talk about inheritance for, which is about code reuse. We're gonna talk about three different versions of implementing this student management system. The first two versions would not use inheritance, and we're gonna criticize on them briefly to see what kind of design principle they violate. I think it's really good for your knowledge. You can feel free to apply that principle to also to your own code, since we don't really evaluate your code in this course. It's a very nice self-checking mechanism you can learn. And after the two versions without using inheritance, we'll introduce you to two important keywords about inheritance in Java. One is extent, the other one is super, right? So these are the two. Uh, keywords you should know how to use them. All right, so that'll be the kind of roadmap. And after that, if we have time, we'll cover a little bit more stuff. We'll see, okay? But definitely we'll get into the second deeper aspect about inheritance on Wednesday. Today, we're paving the foundation. All right, so this will be the second attempt on the slides, but I want to give you the first attempt without inheritance for implementing the student management system, okay? So this is first design attempt. This does not use any inheritance, meaning that even without the knowledge of inheritance, you would be able to understand it. Let me go over with you very quickly, and then I'll give you guys a little bit of hints about how you can criticize on this design. At this level, you guys shouldn't really be too satisfied with any code you're given. Well, it, it doesn't really mean when it's working, then that's good, not necessarily. That's something uh, we have to learn to be critical. All right, for this one here, we have a class called students. That's the only class we have, okay? Of course, we assume that we got a course class. That's not a core one, so let's focus on the students. So we got an array of courses. We got NLC for keeping track of the courses, the same as before. And I remember on Wednesday after class, Ferris actually asked me, based on the problem description, should we also declare another attribute called kind? So there you go. So that's gonna make it work but not necessarily a good design, as we'll criticize later. So we have an integer over here for the kind. And if you recall your knowledge about integer in Java, is 32 bits, which means you can support up to two to the power of 32 kinds of students in practice, more than enough. So this is a very good decision, at least at this level. And we put the two possible rates over here, premium rates for resident students, if you remember. Premium rates over here, for resident students, and also discount rates for non-resident students. And we have a constructor over here, and whenever we want to create a student, we're going to pass the kind of students we want to create. For example, let me give you two lines of code here right away. I might say students, resident students, would be a new student. And in this case, I just pass one. On the other hand, I can create another instance. Let's say students 
non-resident students would be another new students. And then here would be two. You can see one and two over here are the ways we can distinguish between the two kinds of students. Of course, the more students you want to support, the more possibility you can add to the parameter or argument here. Right? Hopefully, so far, so good. Internally, let's say we want to focus on two methods, get tuition and also register a course for the students. They're going to be done in a very similar way, in the sense that the way you get a tuition for the students depends on whether it's kind number one or kind number two. Similarly, the way you're going to register a course also depends on whether they are resident students or non-resident students. Just keep that in mind. Okay, let's take a look. How do we get a tuition? Here, you can think about this part over here, which is what I call the base amount. Meaning that you simply just go over the array of courses over here, and then simply sum up the fee together. Let's say if you take two courses, one is $500, the other one's $300, you simply add them up together, right? Using, an array, uh, using a loop. This is what I call the base amount. And then we're gonna do some discrimination in the following sense. If it happens to be a resident student, if the kind is equal to one, for example, in this case, we're gonna multiply the base rate by premium rate. Otherwise, if the kind is equal to two, corresponding to non-resident students, and then we're gonna apply discount rate, right? Not too bad, I hope. So you can think about, after these two lines, if I say rs.get tuition, at some point, let's say, dot, 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 we have added some courses to the students already. Versus, if I say nrs dot get tuition. Right, you can now take a look here. Get tuition, get tuition. And we are calling this method here. The context object is really RS versus NRS. Depending on what kind it is, it's going to calculate differently, right? That's something we understand. What about register? Also similar. Eventually, we want to add the course into the array apply by applying our pattern. But let's say for now, for resident students, we, only, uh, we allow them to take no more than six courses, let's say, because they live on campus, they might just take more. And let's say for non-resident students, since they, they, they don't live on campus, they might need to take some time for commute. In that case, they got fewer, right? Let's say that's a policy. You just need a, a, a discrimination here for treating the students. All right, are we okay so far for attempt number one? The spirit of this implementation here is we are being explicit about the kind of students as an attribute. Seem to be quite reasonable, but there are two design flaws that we can criticize, okay? Guys, be careful about what I say here. I said they have design flaws. However, I'm not saying they, they don't have any, they have no implementation flaws. So what I mean here is, in terms of the code working, that's okay. You can still pass all the JUnit test cases without any issue. But if we want to be more critical about maintainability, what if your software is subject to changes for later? Then this version here is not considered as good. All right? I'm going to give you guys some hints. This is a little bit more advanced, but I think you guys deserve to know this kind of knowledge at this point. I have one design criterion called cohesion. Have you guys heard about the word cohesion before? If no, if yes, you want to raise your hand, just tell me what it is, just in case you have heard about it. If no, that's okay. Okay, if nobody, that's okay, don't worry. Let me give you the definition, and then I want you guys to think in terms of a cohesion, once you know the definition, why would this particular design number one violates cohesion? All right, let me put it down. The definition for cohesion really is for software design. A class collects relevant, okay, how about, let me put it this way. Collects attributes and methods which are relevant to a common theme.
meaning that all the attributes you put into a single class, or all the methods you put into a single class, they should be somehow relevant to each other. If they somehow belong to a different kind of concept, they shouldn't be put together. All right? And just for your knowledge, in software design, there is a notion called Superman class. All right? Maybe that's something you guys have been doing, maybe since your first year. Okay? That's something you would like to avoid, maybe from today. Something is called Superman class. Well, Superman can do anything, can do everything. You have a single class over here, and then whatever stuff you can put to solve your problem, you put it into a single class. So think about for your lab number one, lab number two. Rather than having three to four different classes, you simply have a single class to put 100 attributes and 100 methods over there to solve the problem. It can be done, but very poor practice. All attributes and methods for solving a problem go into this single class. And the Superman class is a typical example for violating the cohesion because you put everything, even though they are not so relevant to each other, into one. For example, you might put, let's say in your lab number two, you put vaccine information and appointment information into the same class. They're not, they're not supposed to be. They should be in separate classes. All right, Superman class, I think that's for your knowledge. Your instructor, maybe in 3311 software design, may mention this term again. If they don't, now you know what they really mean. Okay? Let's go back. Do you guys see any violation of cohesion for the student class over here? Are we putting anything that's kind of not exactly related to each other in a single class? Ferris. You mean here, the courses? Yeah, the race. The, the race, okay. In some way, I agree with you. But I think in this way. So I would say I'll tend to argue the course is definitely relevant to a single student. That one is okay. Yeah. yeah. But for the race, yes. Okay. So whether or not the race itself may be relevant to the courses, it's kind of uh, arguable. I would tend to argue this is relevant to this because let's say if I got a resident students, in order for me to calculate the tuition, what courses I have taken already, also what kind of rate I'm going to right? So I think between this and this, they are relevant. But if you look at these two, are they really relevant to each other? Not really, because this one here belongs to resident students. This one here belongs to non-resident students. You should really put one, but not both, in a single class. So a better solution in terms of design is to have two classes. Maybe one is called resident students class with only premium rates. The other one would be non-resident students class with only discount rate, separate the two attributes. That would be a better solution. All right, that's cohesion. So guys, cohesion is a very common design criterion. I would say I'm, I can only offer you just one example here, very simple here, but I would encourage you, once you know about cohesion really means at an abstract level, try applying them. I think the more you apply, the more sense you will get from applying them, right? All right, so I would say this one violates cohesion, and a better way is to separate them into different class. Should be separated. Two different classes. All right, that's number one. Okay, so design as flaw number one. It violates cohesion. Okay, what about violation number two? This one is slightly trickier, so I'm going to dive into it right away. Okay? So there is another design principle which is also very important for you to grasp. It's intuition. It's called single choice principle. I would say don't be too bothered by the name itself. The name itself does not suggest very good intuition to you. The way I'll put it is, there should be no duplicates in your code. Okay? Think of it intuitively, no duplicates. Okay? The single choice principle tells you that if you actually don't have any duplicates in your software, that means whenever you want to make a change, 
you don't really have to change the duplicates. You change only a single place, okay? Meaning that if a change is needed only one place needs to be changed. All right, let's now review our student class. Hey, we discussed before, this will violate cohesion, but let's, deal with, uh, let's bear with them just for now. I want you to take a look, let's say just this method here, and this method here, one and two. Okay, do you guys see any kind of a duplicates here? I got a little hint for you. The duplicates that we have in these two methods, of course, potentially we can get more methods that will be implemented in a very different, uh, very similar way to discriminate between the student clients. The duplicates we have are a consequence of this attribute over here. All right. Yes. The two if statement, you want to be a little bit more precise? Are you talking more about the body of the if statement? The condition. Uh, yes, I, I agree, I agree. Okay, so guys, let me uh, make it more explicit for you. You can see here, we got condition number one, if the client is one, that means if the current student is a resident student. That one is repeated again in another method because we always have to discriminate between the student kind, right? Duplicate number one. Number two, also else if kind is equal to two, kind is equal to two, right? So you can see, imagine the following. If we have 10 kinds, that means for every method that we want to define for the student class, we have to do if, else, if so much for 10 different kinds of students for every method. That's the kind of magnitude of duplicates we have to do. Let's see how bad is this, this, uh, this duplicate here. I'll give you one example here, or two. Number one. What if we want to have a new kind of student? Let's say we have international students. Let's say, if we have international student, let's say kind, if kind is equal to three, that means international. Now, can somebody tell me, if I have a new kind over here, which parts am I supposed to change on the code, on the two methods? What am I supposed to do? Ferrets. Change both in what way? Yeah, I agree. Thank you. That's exactly right. So here you're going to say else if this dot kind equals equals three. Put something here relevant to, you know, get tuition for international students. And also, you also have to insert over here, else if, and then you're gonna say this dot kind equals equals three, the same as before, and then put something here relevant to the registration for international student, right? You can see, in, if I wanna add a new kinds of students, I need to put multiple changes in different places, right, in the class, right? Imagine if you got 100 different methods for your student class, realistically, in that way, how many places do you have to change for this else if statement? 100, right? That's how you think of it. The tricky thing about judging your design is maybe some changes you argue that might be bad may not be happening at this moment, but it's a reasonable change to anticipate for later. So that's a tricky part. But you guys are just uh, being introduced to this idea. Just try to uh, absorb as much as possible. One more. What about an existing kind is obsolete? Let's say for some reason, now they cancel non-resident students. Oh, sorry, they now, let's say they now cancel resident students, no accommodation on campus. In that way, we're gonna delete this part here, and also we're gonna delete this part here as well. Again, still multiple places, right? In multiple methods, right? All right, so let me recap very quickly. The very initial design we have is just about having this kind attributes to explicitly note which kind of student we, uh, we have for the objects, right? Either one or two. Implementation-wise, at a coding level, it's good. It definitely can make things work. However, design-wise, it violates cohesion, 
and single choice principle. And that's something you guys should really try to learn. And feel free to apply these two principles to your code for the lab, since we don't really evaluate your code closely for this uh, course. But you guys can try. And if you want more feedback, let me know. All right, any more questions about design attempt number one? Right? There's one more thing I want to uh, mention right now. And I would suggest about five lectures later, review this point. Because this point here wouldn't really make much sense unless we talk about dynamic binding. But I will mention that now. Think about this design over here. If you compare this solution here using explicit kind, compare with inheritance, which we're going to see later today. The main difference between this explicit kind and the actual inheritance is really the dynamic type. As a consequence of the inheritance, it's going to manage this kind of kind attributes automatically. Let me put it down, and then you guys will, can revisit this point later. Okay? In inheritance, the dynamic type is an automatic mechanism for managing student kind. I'll try to also revisit this point whenever I can, but just in case I forgot, you can always refer to this point later. Inheritance, you want to focus on dynamic types, which is automatic. You don't have to have that explicit attribute about what kind of student you're talking about, because in principle, they can be many. All right? Just keep that in mind. All right, design attempt number two, which I'm going to use the slides uh, a bit, and then I'm going to do some more visualization. So now this will be the second design attempt to the problem without inheritance. Let's go for some code. Let's say, okay, so this design here, I can tell you right away, that one is going to resolve the cohesion problem. So we're going to separate out pre uh, premium rates and discount rate into different classes. So we got resident students, and let's say we got name, we got courses, we got NOC, right? The same as design number one. Also, we got premium rates only. Only premium rate that's relevant to resident students will be here. We wouldn't see discount rate, okay? And constructor, we got register, and also we got get tuition. And the get tuition here, since we are now in the context of resident students, we know that we should apply the base tuition to the premium rates over here. All right? Guys, are we good so far about resident students? Steer at that for 20 seconds very quickly. And here's my question for you. If we follow the same logic, how are we going to create the non-resident student class? Number one. Number two, in that way, are we going to create lots of duplicates? Two questions for you. 20 seconds. All right. Yes, I'll point to you. Just give me a moment. Yes, any insight to share? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, possibly just maybe from premium rate into discount rate. That's what you would do. I agree. And hopefully you will also pick up my visual hints for you. Whatever I highlighted in yellow here, those are the things that wouldn't be duplicates. Everything else would be duplicate. Let's see. Okay. To be more precise, we're gonna change from resident student to uh, sorry, we're gonna change from resident students into non-resident student. We'll change from premium rate into discount rate. Change the name of the constructor and change the variable here. That's the only thing we're going to change. Everything else will be duplicates. Cohesion is OK, but single choice principle, meaning duplicates, are very bad. Okay. Let's take a look. Non-resident students, we got name, we got course. You can see this part here is complete duplicates from the other class. Wouldn't it be nice if we can somehow have a common place to store all the sharing part and let the two classes to share that part? Okay, well, just keep that in mind. And also, we got discount rate. You can see cohesion is satisfied because discount rate is relevant to 
non-resident students only. And also we got uh, constructor, we got register, and get tuition, you can see this part here about calculating the base amount is duplicated. This part here to apply the discount rate is not duplicated, right? So you ought to know exactly where code has been duplicated. I think we are moving a little bit closer towards the final solution by using inheritance. But I would like you guys to really remember this second design over here satisfy cohesion because we only keep discount rate or premium rate in the relevant class only. Number two, we got lots of duplicates, okay? Let's go a little bit, uh, before I talk about the criticism about this design, let's see how this class, how this uh, setup is gonna run. Let's take a look. So I have a little tester over here to go over with you. Okay, let's go over them quickly. Very easy to visualize. Okay, let's take a look. Well, you can, you can see I put the two classes side by side. You can see only these parts are not duplicated, right? The rest are simply duplicated. Let's say we want to test this particular student's implementation, okay? We create C1 and C2, two courses, okay? So we got, okay, let's say, uh, let me use a different color here. C1 and C2. Okay, C1 and C2, and 2030, 3311. 2030, 3311, let's say 500, hypothetically, may not be true. And then, let's say we want to create the first students here, Jim. You can see Jim here is a resident student. And then, with a name, okay, the name, okay, the name you can, uh, Visualize yourself, but that one there we can omit. And what's important is we want to set the premium rates for gym to be 1.25. So that means this part here is going to be 1.25. Okay. And then we're going to register two courses for gym, C1 and also C2. The first course will be C1, the second course will be C2, right? You guys know pretty well how to trace that. And what about the second one? Non-resident students, Jeremy. Okay, and we got his name, and also we want to set its, his discount rate to be 0 0.75. 0 0.75 over here, and then register also C1 and C2. So C1 here, and C2 over here. And finally, what we want to do is to compare these two lines. Jim.getTuition, Jeremy.getTuition. How are they, are they going to differ? Okay, let's take a look. If I do gym.getTuition here, let's say here, because the context object is gym, and gym was declared to be a resident student, so I should really go to this version of the getTuition. Agree? So we're going to execute this loop over here, which is going to calculate the base. The base will be, you can see gym will be, of course, it will be 500 plus 500. So this part will be 1,000 and then multiply by the premium rates, which we set to be 1.25. So ultimately, we're gonna get 1,250. Make sense? Okay. Let's do another one. What about this one here? The context object is Jeremy. So we are calling a different version of the get tuition because Jeremy was declared to be uh, here. And non-resident students. So we're going to call this version over here. The same duplicated calculation as before, we're gonna add up 500 and 500, right? You can see these are the two courses. So that'd be also 1,000. But now, we're gonna multiply the base rate by discount rate, which is 0 0.5. So that means we're gonna get 750, okay? All right, so we're okay with this, okay? There's a little look ahead I want to tell you. Okay. Remember this visualization here, which is, should be no surprise to you. After discussing the, uh, some shortcomings of this, uh, this design, I'm going to go into the, uh, the inheritance version. That would be the ultimate version. Amazingly, the way we're going to visualize the objects at the runtime will be basically the same as this one. Okay? So the only improvement you can think about we are making, one of the uh, improvements we make, to go from this design number two 
into the ultimate rec uh, inheritance version is we got rid of the duplicates. That's one thing to always remember. Okay. Okay. Any question about this? Marcus, please. So um, because we know all, all the resident students have the same rate, right? Mm -hmm. So would it, wouldn't it make more sense to make the rates a static variable so it's yep. shared between all of the things instead of setting it each Yes, I, I will tend to agree with you. That's a very good one. So what Marcus actually just said, which I'll tend to agree, assuming that the policy is to apply the same, for example, premium rate to all the resident students, it might make more sense to make it static. But maybe just for illustration, we can make it local. Or it really depends on the application scenario. If we're assuming that all the resident students will have the same premium rates, of course, static. If for some reason, that's kind of the minimum rate you should have, and some people might have different ones, you know, between resident students, they might want to make it non-static. So it depends. But I'll make a note here for you guys to think. Premium rate is a very good observation. Assuming that all the resident students have the same premium rates, we may make it static. So it's a shared copy by all the resident students' class, resident students' uh, uh, objects. Very good. Okay, so let me talk about very quickly about the shortcomings for this one here, for this design. Basically, the issue is about maintenance of code, single choice principle. We got lots of duplicates, so if you got duplicate, it just make it hard to really make changes to maintain your software, single choice principle, right? So let me just show you one possibility, okay? Let's say this. I'll show you one. The other one you can do as a little exercise, very easy. So we got our resident students, uh, we got our non-resident students. Let's say this. At the moment, you can see the way we do register here, register here. So these two are duplicated, first of all. This part here is identical to, oh, let me just draw better. This part here is the same as this part over here, completely duplicated. And let's say now, we want to make the registration conditional in the following sense. Pretty much like, you know, if you uh, actually want to in increment the counter, remember? If you want to inc increment the counter, if the current value for the counter is already the maximum, you don't want to, want to allow that. Similar idea. We want to say if the number of courses, the counter, is already larger than or equal to the maximum allowance, assuming there's such a constant somewhere in your class. Okay, we're gonna throw some exception. Otherwise, we should allow the course to be added, pretty much like what we're doing here. So the idea would be we want to add some extra constraint to allow the maximum number of courses you may register, which is more realistic, okay? The only thing I want you to convince yourself is if this is something I would like to change for both kinds of students, is there only a single place I need to change? If it was, the single choice principle was maintained. If not, it was violated. It's that simple, okay? So guys, only a single place or multiple places? Multiple. multiple, I agree. That's quite obvious, right? So basically, you want to think about, you want to change this part over here by adding the constraint. Also, you gotta change this part over here by adding the constraint as well. So multiple places. If you got 10 kinds of students, in that way, you gotta change 10 different places. So duplicates are really bad. The consequence is whenever you want to maintain your code by making changes, you gotta change multiple places throughout your projects, okay? All right, so that's the first change. And for the second one, I just gave you a different one. Let's say whenever you want to calculate tuition, you may want to do also inflation rate over here as well. Again, you got to change multiple places. For that one, I assume you'll be, you'll be okay. All right, take a look on this change over here. All right, and then one more thing. Let me just see uh, if I miss anything on the slides. Okay, the two changes. And this slide here is also very important, okay? Remember the student management system also need to be a class. So, so far we only talk about students. 
What about a student management system which will store kind of like a collection of students? How do we implement that, right? I have a simple question for you. We only got two kinds of students, resident students and non-resident students. Let's say we talk about design number two, right? The duplicated code. How many arrays do we need in order to store both kinds of students? Let me make it, uh, let me make this point clear, okay? Let me sketch what we have so far. Remember in design number two, we got a class called, I'll just say RS for resident students, remember. We got another class called non-resident students. That's what we have for design number two. Let's say we now want to create another class called student management system. And in order to really, uh, well, at the runtime, at the runtime, tell me whether or not this is possible. Let's say I got the SMS, it's pointing to some rest, uh, student management system objects, let's say. So student management system. Is it possible for me to have maybe a student's array? And then over here, I want to say maybe some objects over here would be resident students and some objects over here would be non-resident students. Is it possible? Okay. If you, I would say this, uh, this question, uh, the answer here is a little bit uh, funny. I would say yes and no. When you guys say no, I tend to more agree with you because based on what you have learned, no. Because, for example, I'll talk about the yes part very quickly in a, in a bit. Let's say this. If in here, okay, in here, if you try the following. If you say, for example, well, you don't have a student class, by the way, right? If I say resident students array, let's say students, okay? And then let's say new resident students, let's say 100 to begin with. And it's definitely okay for you to say students at index zero is assigned to a new resident students. And then with some, right, it's not, not, uh, by the way, it's anonymous objects on the right-hand side. This one here is actually fine because this one here is matching this one over here. So this is fine. On the other hand, if I try students at index one, for example, is a new non-resident students, would this be okay? No, not. Quickly, an array of students, every member must have the same type, resident students. So you cannot assign non-resident student object to it. You cannot. That's why I would argue it's no. And if you really think this way, good for you, all right? However, you need to know the complete truth. There is a way to get around with this. If, for your information, if I decide, define it to be objects, Remember the object class, right? We only talk about it when we talk about the, uh, the equals method to say object is the parent class of every class. That's what we said before. If I say object over here, and then you say students. And in this way, you will be able to say students index zero will be new resident students. You can also say students index one, let's say new non-resident students. Both are actually fine. In terms of why this will be okay, it will be much more explained once we talk about variable assignments for inheritance. But let me just make a conclusion for you. This design here is a no-no. Very poor design. 
And if we have time, maybe towards the end of the in inheritance lecture discussion, I'll try to discuss why this will be so bad. Again, this one here is gonna violate single choice principle. But the way it's gonna violate it is a bit tricky. We have to know about typecasting, but it's only for later, all right? All right, let me recap. For design number two, without the inheritance, you just cannot have a single array, either of type resident students or of type non-resident students, such that at a runtime you wanna store both kinds of students, you just cannot. Right, that's the main thing to know. But one thing for later is, if you change this to be objects, programmatically you can make it work. Design-wise, it's very, very bad, which we'll explain later, all right? Yeah, just keep that in mind. It's really important for you to see. And you guys can just take a look at this code over here. I'll give you a little bit of highlights and then we can move on. Okay, so here you can see we got resident students, we got non-resident students, diff two different arrays, right? And then you can see whenever we are in here for counter, we got one for this array, we got another counter for this array over here. Whenever you want to add a students over here, you want to say either I want to add resident students or non-resident students and define the parameter type accordingly. You can see the number of attributes for arrays, the number of methods, just grows as you grow the uh, kinds of students. So it seems like it's not so good for this design. Finally, you can see if I want to have a method here to say I want to register a single course, maybe a common course for all kinds of students, I need one loop to go over this array. I need another loop over here to go over the other array. There's no way around. I cannot just have a single loop since I have multiple arrays, okay? So here, multiple duplicated because you can see the way we actually call, uh, define the loop, call the method, is really duplicated. So it's not so good, all right? The multiple duplicated loops are necessary, which is bad because we got multiple arrays. Right, you can see one array over here just for resident students, the other array just for non-resident students, okay? And if you go back to the slides, there is a very critical link I want you to try later. You can see there is a link over here, a polymorphic collection of students. So this link here is gonna link you to maybe about slide 89 or something, which means in about three or four lectures time, we're gonna talk about if you got inheritance is going to solve this problem completely. You, uh, despite the number of kinds of students you have in your system, you can have just a single array to really accommodate all kinds of students at the runtime, rather than having so many multiple arrays. So that link is only for later, for you to com uh, compare and contrast. I'll make sure I also revisit this link uh, when I get there, all right? All right, guys, do you have any questions so far? Right. We haven't really seen inheritance just yet, but you know, we're getting very, very close. I would suggest we take a break. How about today we don't take attendance because I think some of your class may, may be delayed because of the go bus strike. How about we be nice to them just for today? Why don't you guys take a two minutes break and then after the break, we're gonna talk a little bit about the different modifier for visibility and then we'll talk about how you can use inheritance. Okay, just take two minutes break and then we'll come back. Okay, one more minute and then we will resume. We got another 30 minutes to go for today.
Okay, we'll resume in just one moment. Hmm? No, I said we wouldn't take attendance today because many might be uh, you know delayed by the go bus strike, so we wouldn't take it. Maybe we'll do that on Wednesday. Hopefully, they got a deal before Wednesday. All right. Okay. Two more things I'm planning to talk about today. The first one here is something you ought to know, especially if you program much in Java. Uh, it's more about using modifier like a private, public, pro uh, protected, or without any modifier. I want to give you the uh, full story here just to summarize uh, using some small example. And then we'll move on to the student management system with inheritance. That's what we'll do, okay? Uh, I want to show you, oh, something I want to show you quickly. I forgot to do that before the break. So I'm going to make two example projects available to you today for your reference. One is, sorry, the, the font is really tiny. I'll read it to you. One is called Example Inheritance Projects. If you go under that, it's going to contain two packages. One is without the inheritance. So that one there is the design number two that we spoke about before the break. And there will be another one which is with inheritance. That one there will use the extend and super keyword which we're going to explain. Okay, so you can also refer to these. And for your lab number four and five, later you will need to use the super and also extend keyword. So just use uh, that package as a reference point. And the rest over here for the project over here, that would be the example for illustrating the modifier, which I'm going to talk about now. All right, let's get it clear. Okay, good. So what we want to do now is to illustrate to you how to really use the modifier uh, differently. For this course, uh, for your lab, it doesn't really matter which one you use. I would say just remember the rule, and also if you want to practice, just practice as much as you can. Right? But anyway, I'll tell you the rule. They are very straightforward. Let's say the following. We have a project. So we got different levels here. We got project, and also we got packages. One, animal. Second package, furniture. Third package, shape. We got three different packages. Within a package, we also got different classes. For example, under animal, we got cat and dog. Under furniture, we got chair and desk, and etc. Three levels, project, package, and class. At these three levels, so there is a notion about visibility. What does it really mean? For example, let's say if I declare under the chair class, right? you, can see, you can see chair is under furniture. If I declare an attribute over here, Depending on what modifier I use, either private, public, protected, or let's say without modifier, there are four possibilities over here. Depending on which modifier I might use, the visibility of chair, of that attribute in the chair, could be, let's say, only within a class, or maybe within the package, or within everything else. It depends, right? That's something I want to make uh, very uh, precise. Let's go over some slides, and I'll show you some vision. Okay, so let's see the first one here. Okay, what about for classes? For class, it's uh, basically you can either say class or public class. You cannot say private class. You cannot say protected class. You cannot, right? There are only, possibility, uh, only two possibilities. And you cannot say private class, right? And what about the visibility? Let me go over the rule and then I'll show it to you. Let's say if you want to make a class available only within the package. In that case, don't put any modifier. For example, you might just put class chair. Many of the examples you saw on the slides throughout the course, I simply put class chair. I said forget about public, right? So in that case, it's only available within the package, not other packages in the same project. Another possibility would be if you simply say public. That one would make it completely open to all the other packages, all the other classes in the same project, basically. Right? Right? So you can see the difference, either class or public. Right? And this is a visual you can see. I'll show it to you. Okay? So we only got two possibilities here for the class. Either you declare chair to be just a class. You can see this is without modifier. Right? This one here is without modifier. That would mean 
the desk can refer to chair. However, circle cannot refer to chair because it's outside its current package furniture. Pretty straightforward, right? What if I really want a chair to be visible to this class and this class? Well, in that case, declare that to be public. Okay. So as soon as you do that, the public over here open to all. Can we actually say, I want this class to be available only to this package, but not this one? No, you cannot do that, I'm afraid. It's either open within your own package, or, oh sorry, either open within your package, or open among all the packages, only these two, okay? Good. And of course, for your lab, you can decide what you want to do. Yes, question. Uh, sorry, say it again. Can we say without a modifier here, similar to? Um, I see what you mean. You wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's a private class because if I say, if, you, if I say I don't really have a broad modifier for chair, in some ways it's not private. Private would mean only itself can see it. But you can see desk can still refer to it. So I wouldn't say that's a private one. Mm -hmm, yeah. All right, good. All right, guys, that's about the classes, okay? And let's now go to the fun part about attributes. We've got four possibility, okay? Let's see. All right, and I would say the best way for, I, rather than reading off the slides, I'm gonna use a table to summarize what you should know over here. Only a single page, but for you, for you to study, you wanna study the written detail on the slides, okay? Let's see. Let me go over this table with you. Uh, let's say this. Let's say we have in the chair class, you remember chairs is in the context of furniture. Let's say in this chair class, we actually got either private or protected or public or without any modifier. So we got one, two, three, and four. Four possibility, okay? So far, I think one and two might be more common to our context, but I said to you, to really try to make sure, always make sure you got, you got private attributes. There might be certain points you want to maybe consider other possibility for yourself, all right? Again, you got a private, no modifier, protected, or public. And this table over here summarizes, for example, if I declare the, oh, by the way, so either you declare the uh, attribute to be private or method to be private, the visibility constraint will be just the same. That's why I'm only talking about private uh, attribute here. For methods, it will be the same as well. Let's say, for example, how do you read the table? And then I'll try to visualize to show to you. It's very logical. Let's say I declare attribute to be private. Only its own declaring class can see it. What about the package? What about other classes in the package? No, they cannot see it. What about other classes that are subclasses of this class in the same package? No, you cannot. What about other subclasses not in the same package but in the other package? Also, you cannot. What about other classes? Well, just you know, in the project, right? So you got different possibility here. Let's see. Let's start with the first one. The first one here, let's say I got private W. If I declare this attribute to be in the chair class, of course, the chair itself can access it. Anywhere else? Not really. That's why it's called private. As soon as you declare W to be private, only its declaring class can access it. If you try to use W here, let's say in another class or in another package, there will be compilation error. Okay, that's private, okay? And what about with no modifier? If I say with no modifier, let's say this one here, purple, X, okay? So let me just write down over here. That one there is just W. And let's say for purple, if no modifier, at least, its declaring class can use it. For sure. And what's more? All the classes in the same package, they can also use it, okay? So it's also visible to other classes in the same package. 
What about classes outside this package? For example, cat, dog, rocking, uh, rocking chair, circle, square? Not really, right? Okay, so only that. So, so far we got private, it's restricting to your own class only. If you got no modifier, it's going to be restricted to classes in the same package. All right, so far, that's good. Okay. By the way, public is so straightforward, so I'll do public the last. So now, protected is something I will only mention at this point. When we later talk about how uh, the inheritance code, I wouldn't really mention protected because protected itself is nothing to do about inheritance uh, theory itself. It's only about visibility. So just see what protected really means. If I declare, let's say here, this one's interesting. If, you, if I say Y is a protected attributes, okay? And let me just go back here. And don't forget, this one purple is actually X, okay? What about Y? Apparently, always the declaring class can, ac uh, can access the attribute no matter what, okay? So this one here is uh, Y. And think about protected actually got two meanings. is as if okay as if actually you know what it'd be easier to say this number one a practicable uh, let's say visible sorry visible to subclasses in either the same package or other package. So what do I mean? Okay, let's say this. If I try to see why, number one, why is visible in the same class that it was declared? And let's say at the moment we say we got bubble chair, which extends chair. I'll explain the extents once we get to the student management system. Let's say we declare that. If bubble chair extends chair, meaning that bubble chair is one kind of chair, pretty much like a resident student is one kind of students. Okay? In that way, we, uh, we say that bubble chair is a subclass of chair. Okay? In that way, we can definitely refer to the Y in bubble chair. So that's why this part here should be good. Okay? And what about subclasses that happen to be in another package? For example, you can see we got a rocking chair, which is, which is supposed to be another kind of chair, but it happens to be in, in another package. You can see it's in the shape rather than in furniture, but we can still access, right? So that's why you will see here too. Okay, and uh, I think that'll be it. One more. There's another one here that could be a little bit confusing. Okay? So this, that's why I said only one. Number two, other classes in the same package. So far we talk about if Y was declared as protected, it's going to be visible to the current class all the subclasses either in the same package or not in the same package. One more thing. What about other classes, for example, desk, in the same package, but not really a subclass? In that way, it's also visible. That's the rule. That's the confusing bit. This one here is also fine. So when you study for that, this will be how I remember it myself. As if. No modifier, which means all the classes in the same package can access it, plus subclasses in other packages. All right, that's how I, I would suggest you remember it. Okay, the final one, final one. What about public over here? That one, no brainer. Because if we declare, for example, 
over here, let's say Z, over here, in this class that's being public. In that way, all the classes, not only in the same package, but also in the other packages, they will also be visible as well. All right? So these are the four possibilities. And what should you study the best for this one? Number one, read over the slides about all the principles I just went over and try to focus more on this particular table here, number two. Number three, which will be the most critical part, go to the source code which I reproduce. Basically, almost all the possible scenario over here. You can, uh, it's very tiny font, but one of them is about the classes visibility and also about package level and also about subclasses level. So look at the source code carefully. That kind of re reaffirms what we actually mentioned in the slides. All right, that's how you study visibility. All right, any question about visibility? The reason that I want to mention it right away is you, some, some, uh, sometimes you might run into, if you try to search some Java code online for your uh, more example, you might see protected, sometimes you might see without protected or private. You're kind of wondering how, they, how the different modifiers play together. So that will be the full story to know. All right? All right. Yep, make sure you master that. Okay, so everything has been covered, right? The different possibility. And that's the table. And this part here is important. For the rest of the inheritance lecture, we assume we put all the relevant classes in the same package. So we don't really need protected. We don't really need it. All right? That's all we assume. So whenever you see, I don't really put a protected modifier besides the attributes, you can assume, because they all reside in the same uh, package, so I don't need to. All right, just remember that. All right, any question after this point? It's a minor digression from the inheritance, I would say, but it's still relevant. All right, the next one is about now. Finally, let's see how we can use inheritance. Okay, I got about 15 minutes. I think that's a, that's a nice uh, time constraint. So what, what I need you guys to know uh, now to help me, I'm gonna present how you're gonna implement a student, uh, the student class with a resident student or non-resident students. I'll show you the code line by line. If there's any point you really don't find it uh, clear, interrupt me, right? Because you will need this kind of a code structure for your lab number four and five and also the final programming test, right? It's really to your benefits since uh, you're here. All right, so overall, we're gonna get this kind of a hierarchy, okay? We got resident students, we got non-resident students, and we got another student. And here's one thing, one principle you wanna remember right away. Whenever you want to create the so-called taller, well, like a, like a parent clause on the top in the students, most likely, you want to declare something in common over there that can be shared by all the subclasses. That's something we'll see. And this is to make sure we satisfy the single choice principle without any duplicates. Remember that, okay? And we got extent. And also a look ahead to later lecture. This inheritance hierarchy here is very simple. We call that it only has one level, only two levels. You can think about level one, we got the parent class. Level two, we got resident student, one resident student. In practice, the inheritance hierarchy can be up to 10 levels or 11 levels. It could be. I will show you one that's maybe about three or four levels. At least you get an idea. That's something we'll see later. Okay, but for now, that's good enough for today. Right, let's now take a look at the code. Okay, and we're gonna have three classes in total. Let's go one by one. Students, resident students, and non-resident student. For student class, regular class, you wouldn't see any hints about inheritance in this class, not yet. You only see the Q or the hints in the subclasses. So we got students, and now just remember, everything you think the subclasses of students should share in common should be put in the parent class because they will be inherited later. So we got name, courses, and OC, right? Remember design number two, it, we have to duplicate these decorations in the resident students and non-resident student classes. But in inheritance, we don't need to anymore, okay, remember. So we got this, uh, this part here. 
Also, we got a student constructor, and the way we initialize the name and also courses, they can also be inherited, and we'll, I'll show to you. Also, we got register, right? And also, we got get tuition. And notice that this part here is only calculating the base amount. If you notice that at this point, we are not talking about whether it's for resident students or not resident student. At this level, we don't have to know, all right? That's a very important insight I want to write down right away, right? For now, don't worry too much about these two just yet, okay? Two points I want to make clear. Number one, declare what's in common among subclasses. In design number two, what's in common is duplicated, but in this case, we don't want to have duplicates. And for subclasses here, it can be either resident students or non-resident students. That's point number one. Point number two, I want you to look at this part over here. So this part here is the base amount calculation. And this part may be shared amount classes. And we can see how later we can actually re uh, reuse this part over here in the subclasses. So there is a special keyword you have to use called super. Okay, we'll get there. Right, so that's the student class. Okay, so let's talk about the two subclasses. They will be uh, implemented in a very similar way. Resident students. Okay, we declare the class and that's the thing you want to hint to the Java compiler. You're saying the following. The resident students, from the code reuse point of view, is going to inherit everything you declare in the student class, including name, courses, constructor, register, and get tuition, literally everything. So we are saying that you inherit everything from your parents. May not be so true you know, in reality, but that's the, the coding analogy we are making, okay? All right, let's take a look. All right, extends is the new keyword you want to learn, right? Really important. And then we say for resident student, we still got premium rate. This one here is similar to the uh, second design attempt. But did you notice one thing here? We are not declaring name, courses, NOC anymore because we have inherited that from the parent class student already. So that's why they are implicit. That's something you want to get over. It might be a little bit, little bit weird in the beginning, okay? That's something I want to write down right away. If you look at here, extends, that means you want to inherit everything from the parents. And over here, there's something you can see. Okay, let me make it clear to you. The resident students class does not need to redeclare these attributes. No duplication because of the extends keyword. Right? They are implicit. No need to redeclare, which will create duplicates. Name, register courses, number of courses, I'll be very explicit, and also the register, and also get tuition, right, and, and et cetera, right? No need, because of the extend keyword. And similarly, for the non-resident student class as well, okay? Let me go back. Okay, resident student, and now, this is the interesting bit. When we declare the constructor for resident students, we say super name. Wow, What's, what is it doing? Okay, let's see, okay? Thinking this way, whenever you see the keyword super, all you gotta do is to go to the immediate parent class and look for what's being inherited. That's the meaning of super. You might be wondering, 
if I have the class over here and I got a parent class which got another parent class, is it possible to say, sup, uh, if I say super, which will go to this class, right? If I say super dot super, can I go to the grandparent class? Luckily, you cannot. That'd be too confusing. You just cannot, right? So that's something uh, some uh, student always asks me. I want to tell you right away, okay? Then let's see what the super, uh, uh, sorry, the super is doing. Let's say we say super name over here. So this is calling the constructor in the parent class. Yeah, let's see. You can see the constructor is over here. Right? So that's something you can make a link over here. So what, what is that saying? That means I want to call this constructor over here in the parent class with the argument just name. And the name is a parameter of this constructor name over here. What that will do is going to simply execute this constructor like a helper method. And then I'm going to assign the name to be the name and also courses to be courses. That's what you will do. Right? That's the use of super keyword. However, whenever you use a super keyword, that means you, you either want to refer to the constructor in the parent class or maybe the method in the parent class. The way you use it will be a little bit different. Okay, let, let's take a look. Guys, are, are we okay with the, the first one? Super name, right? You just gotta know the syntax. Okay, and notice that we don't have to declare register method anymore because it's been inherited. You only redeclare a method if you want to redefine or override it. And where did we learn about overriding? When was it? For which method? Equals, Equals method, exactly. Now, you now, you now got complete freedom about overriding. Whenever you talk about some inheritance hierarchy, from your parents, you can override any or all of the methods from there. It's completely up to you, okay? I will give you more hints about how you can decide which methods you really override later. Right, in this case, let's say we don't want to override the register method. That's why we simply leave it implicit. But we want to override the get tuition method. Think about the following. In the parent class, we define this base version for the get tuition by just calculating the base amount. And if you remember the visualization from before, let me just remind you very quickly. To calculate the base amount, we simply set over here, 500 plus 500, that's the base amount. But depending on what kind of student you are, you want to apply different rates, right? That's something we want to override, the inherited method. Let's take a look. All right, so here, I want you to look at this method here and also this method here. Let me be very uh, visual here. One here, get tuition from the parent class. One here, the overridden get tuition in one subclass. So this is another overridden version in another class, right? So think about this one here is a parent version. And this one here is the inherited but overridden. And of course, this one as well is also, also overridden. And the way we override the get tuition method is depends on what class you are in, right? Let's take a look. Now we are in the resident students class. We say the way we want to get the tuition is by number one, we want to say super dot get tuition. And based on our understanding, understanding about super so far, it may not be too difficult for you to imagine what this is doing. It is saying super means go to the parent class get to the parent class and then call the get tuition method from there, which will return the base amount. Store the base amount into base and then apply further the premium rates that's only relevant to the resident student class. That's what it is doing. Okay, let me repeat by making some visual. So this one here, super.getTuition. Return the base amount calculation from 
parent class, which is the students from parent class. Right? So that's a base amount calculation. And then after you have stored the uh, value here, you're going to say multiply with the premium rates. For the non-resident student class, you do that in a very similar way. If you look at that, we also call super target tuition. And the advantage of calling super over here is we don't really have to duplicate the code over here in each subclass like what we did in design number two, right? That's the advantage of using inheritance. And then once you get a calculation result in both cases, you can apply premium rates versus discount rate over here. So that's different. Are we okay so far? We have shown to you, number one, how to use the extends keyword. Number two, how to use the super keyword for calling constructor from the parent class. Number three, how to use the super keyword for calling accessor or later on mutators method from the parent class. So three new things you ought to learn. I'll pause a little bit to see if you guys got any question. Guys, are we okay? Okay. Bear with me just for one more minute. I know I'm reaching to the end. I think it's also a nice uh, pausing point. Before Wednesday, please make sure if you can afford the time, study all the way until uh, slide 20. Let me see. Okay, all the way until 28, slide 28, okay? On Wednesday, I'm going to do some very uh, quick recap about what we did today, for just for maybe one or two minutes. And then, assuming that you understand pretty well this slide here, this slide here summarizes something very important for us to understand, to dive deeper into inheritance. So, quickly. So today, we finished the discussion about how to do the code reusing for inheritance using extend super. Starting from Wednesday, we'll dive into the very deep part about inheritance, which is about polymorphism and dynamic binding. That's something we'll do from Wednesday. All right, guys, thank you. And I'll see you tomorrow, Tuesday, for your programming test two. Study hard for lab two. Okay, see you then. <laughs>